Hi, and welcome to What Kind of Internet Do You Want? I'm Amy James, and in this episode, I'm speaking with Tegan Klein. She's a co-founder of Edge and Node, the initial team behind The Graph, which is a protocol for indexing and querying decentralized networks. Tegan is a firecracker. She's been in Forbes 30 Under 30, the information's 30 most powerful in crypto list, and she is incredible at networking and business development. In this episode, we talk about why she left Wall Street for Web3, the importance of incentives and usability over hype, her secrets to successfully launch a network and build a personal brand, how some aspects of Web3 can be self-regulating, and much more. It was a great high-energy conversation. But before we start, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, and let's get into it. Hi, Tegan. Thanks so much for being on What Kind of Internet Do You Want? So good to see you. You as well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited to talk with you today about your background and about the graph. And um, so I thought we would just get started with you telling us, you know, a little bit about yourself for people who don't know who you are and how you got into Web3 and that kind of thing. Totally. Yeah. So I'm Tegan Klein. I'm the co-founder of Edge and Node, the initial team behind the graph. I'm actually originally from a small town in Ohio. Uh, And I really kind of appreciated that upbringing, but I knew that I wanted to kind of expand my horizons and get out of Ohio. So I accepted a full scholarship to a school in New York City. From there, it was mostly a a finance and accounting school. I knew that I did not want to do accounting, kind of went down the the Wall Street path, uh, got into investment banking at a bulge bracket at Bank of America, uh, and then moved over to sales and trading at Barclays. And I was never really passionate about the work in banking. I just kind of was was in it looking for my passion outside of it. Uh, And I found that passion. I actually learned about Bitcoin in 2011 uh, and still kind of went down this traditional Wall Street path. And it was with Ethereum and around 2016 that I really saw the opportunity to create a new internet, to create a new financial system. You know, here, fast forward six years or so, and we're, we're starting to do that. And we're starting to see that come to life which is super exciting. So yeah, Ethereum was really my, the, the reason I left Wall Street to come into the crypto space full time. Cool. So what was that vision that like pulled you in, you know, like n- not specifically the graph, but just like Web3 in general, what are you excited about or what do you see it becoming? Yeah, I think back then it, it was really just Ethereum. It was just kind of crypto, but this idea of a smart contract that could expand Bitcoin kind of beyond just money to every contract that exists in the world. That's really what got me super excited about Ethereum and the possibilities. And it took us a while to kind of get to mass adoption or to start seeing real use cases on Ethereum. And I think the graph is a big piece as to why we kind of saw the DeFi movement, because you need to have these tools that exist uh, in addition to Ethereum, in addition to blockchains. Um, and I'm really excited about Web3 because I think that, you know, we can really take back control online. We, you know, Web2 brought a lot of great things like the creator economy, and it's super fun to tinker around with. But Web2, we very much are the products. And the the business model doesn't really serve anyone other than the kind of centralized tech companies. And, you know, there's issues with algorithms and trying to keep people's attention for long periods of time just to sell them ads. And I think that we can do a lot better with the Internet. And I think that we can give power and control and ownership back to users so that users are really the ones that are benefiting from the web as opposed to just large tech companies. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So do you have like a vision for what Web3 will be like? Do you think that we can can imagine that at this stage or is it just too early no i think it's already happening you see things like like DeFi, where you you have a decentralized exchange Uh, i think that it's starting to happen there's still work to be done on the infrastructure side of web3 which makes it really exciting because it's still super innovative so any for anyone listening if you're not working full-time in web3 you should definitely consider it because it really is the most exciting and innovative place to be right now you know better than early days of wall street better than the early days of the tech boom um so it's a super exciting time but my vision is 
just that we have decentralized applications. They live on their own. Um, so kind of a developer can deploy an application once, let it live forever. We think about incentives in advance of building. Uh, I think that's one of the failures with Web2 is a lot of stuff was built before incentive st structures were thought about. And that's why we have these wonky ad models. And, that's a really uh, good point. Models. There's like there's like kind of that cliche of like, just get users and we'll figure out how we make money later, right? In Web2. Totally. And you ha you take on investors in Web2 and then you're kind of locked into needing to make those investors wealthy. And you can a lot of founders get sucked into that trap, even if they have good intentions initially. Uh, and so it's really important to think about how those incentive structures will work early days. And with the graph, we thought about, we spent about two years uh, thinking about and designing the incentive structure before ever building the decentralized network. Uh, and I think that that's actually really crucial and important. Yeah, absolutely. Because as we're seeing now, despite best intentions really in Web2, the incentives are what ultimately drive behavior and make some of those big decisions that really affect you know, the end users like day to day experience. And, totally. Yeah. Incentives are really are everything. They drive our behavior as much as we, we don't want to admit that it really is the case. Uh, and so it's, I think we can actually change the way we coordinate online. We can change incentive structures. So we're solving bigger problems in the world as opposed to just trying to kind of make as much money for our shareholders as possible. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So then take us into the graph, like give us kind of just like the overview, not super, you know, technical or detailed, but just the elevator pitch. Yeah. So what the graph is, it's a decentralized indexing and query protocol, which most people listening have no idea what that means. So when, when I say index, you can think of like organizing data. And when you say query, you can think of like a ping to an application, like, or a search when you, when you look for something online. And so what the graph does is it organizes data in a decentralized way so that anyone can build anything on top of blockchains much more easily. Uh, and so like when you look for data on a blockchain, it's super difficult. It's like finding a needle in a haystack without the graph. And then when you add the graph, it's so much easier to find that data. And so almost every application in Web3 is using the graph uh, to be able to get data from the blockchain to build really exciting and vibrant applications. And there's a saying that similar to what Google does for the web and making data easy to search and, and organize data online, uh, the graph does that in a decentralized way for Web3. Awesome. That's obviously a super important part of the stack. It's something that I think anybody that's been in blockchain or Web3 for any period of time is pretty familiar with. Just like, you know, looking things up by their TX ID isn't necessarily a long-term sustainable solution. Um, so being able to look for that data in a variety of ways is going to be just like incredibly important to totally. in the future. Yeah, totally. And, you know, you have like air, water, shelter. And I think in the modern day, you can argue that data is just as crucial for our survival. Um, and it's so important. So maybe like a traditional or, or modern day Maslow hierarchy of needs data is at the, like the top of the pyramid. You are the co-founder of Edge and Node, the initial company working on the graph. Can you help us to understand the relationship between the company and the protocol and how all of that works? Yeah, what's exciting is that Edge and Node is one of many companies within the graph ecosystem now. But back in the day when we were still building and, and developing the protocol, there were about 13 of us uh, and we were called the graph back then. And then we launched the graph's decentralized network and the graph became the, the technology, the decentralized protocol, just like Bitcoin and Ethereum are decentralized protocols. Um, and so we rebranded to Edge and Node. We are the initial team behind the graph, but there are actually now six core developers working full time on the graph. There's over 150 people working full time, but the community is really what it's all about. And the community spans over 300,000 people. There's over 4, 400 uh, indexers on the graph network. So you can think like Web2 has one Google, the graph has over 400 Googles. They're really the backbone of Web3, serving those queries so that you can use applications in Web3. Uh, and there's there's hundreds of advocates across the world. So if you're interested in kind of getting involved in Web3, becoming an advocate is a great way to do that. Uh, and then there's 11,000 delegators. I'm a delegator myself. And that's just delegating GRT to help secure the network and to help the indexers serve those queries. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so is it the incentives that we were talking about before that are bringing people in to be part of the graph or are they be are most of those people edge and node employees or, or how does that work? 
Yeah, so it's permissionless. Anyone across the world can participate in the graph. We are very much a mission focused ecosystem and community. Uh, and it's really about getting everyone equal access uh, to Web3 and really changing incentive structures and getting everyone access to that open public data. Got it. That sounds awesome. What are some of your favorite like decentralized applications that have been built using the graph? Do you have some that you oh my gosh, yeah, are they're... excited about? There's so many. One that I really like is ENS, which is uh, decentralized domains. Uh, and it's how you can have like you see on Twitter, people have their username dot ETH or their name dot ETH. And that's through an ENS name. So they use the graph. Um, also, Uniswap, which is a decentralized exchange uh, that doesn't self custody. So unlike FTX with Uniswap, it's a smart contract. They're not taking anyone's funds uh, and that continued working. It's very much solvent in the midst of what we saw uh, with the centralized finance collapse. Uh, so that's another one that I really, really like. Uh, and there's so many others. There's uh, on the on the NFT side, there's art blocks, which has the squiggles. They use the graph. Uh, and so really any application in Web3 that needs data from the blockchain would leverage the graph to organize that data. So I was, you know, looking into your background to prepare for this interview. And it seems like you have just a ton of experience in business development. And um, I was wondering if you have tips for other people, you know, as people are like thinking about coming into Web3, um, what are your best tips or your secrets for success in business development? Because the graph has, you know, really done amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I would say with business development. So there's a misconception that you have to be a coder, you have to be an engineer, you have to be super technical to get into Web3. And it's just not true. Web3, you, you need every skill set imaginable. You need people on the business side, uh, partnerships, sales, uh, you need operations, legal, like the list goes on and on. And so it's really important when you come into the crypto space to kind of have an open mind and, and figure out really what you enjoy doing and where you can really add value. And so I, coming from Wall Street as an analyst on Wall Street, um, I really found my swing on kind of the uh, investor relations side as well as the business development side. So kind of fundraising and all of that early days. Um, and with business development, I would say my top tips are one, just help people whenever you can. If someone is giving a presentation and they say they need X, Y, and Z, go up to them, ask for their card, say, you know, you can help them with whatever they asked for and then execute on that. Um, also, what I would say is volunteer. You should be volunteering with at least two organizations uh, to really network and meet people in the space. So the Graph Advocate Program is a great way to do that, but also local events. So I actually joined Crypto Underground in San Francisco, which is one of the longest standing crypto events uh, in San Francisco. And I became a volunteer and I actually got my first job offer in the crypto space back in the day due to volunteering. You meet so many people. Um, and then I also, right now I host for the Defiant alongside Camilla Russo. So it's great to just be able to interview people to learn that way and also expand your network. Um, so I would say those are kind of two top tips that I, I would give on the BD side. Uh, and then I would also add just kind of creating your own personal brand. It's really important to have a strong personal brand outside of whatever project or company that you're working on um, to really kind of position yourself and make sure people understand your values in the in the space. Yeah, that makes sense. You are are great at that, actually. I was going to ask you about that later, but let's just jump into that right now. What are your tips for creating that strong personal brand? Like, how do you manage to be a founder, you know, do all of the things that you're doing, and then also have this TikTok account that's huge and that you're posting to all of the time? And, you know, just like, how do you how do you do both? How do you think about it? How do you, you know, like, what does your content creation flow look like? How do you fit it into your schedule? Yeah, so I think there's different elements to a personal brand. One is obviously like TikTok and Twitter, uh, but another is kind of having your site and figuring out your identity and, and what you want people to kind of understand you as. And I think that what's really important is having strong, a strong mission and strong values. Um, and so really sitting down with yourself, understanding like who who you are, who who you want the world to see you as, because, you know, as much as we like it or not, we all have a personal brand. Uh, and it's just good to kind of craft that brand and be intentional about it. Um, so I started there. I started with the website. 
Uh, and then from there, you know, I really enjoy creating content. Yes, yeah, so I've gone through a lot of different variations with my TikTok. I started out really kind of per picture perfect content, really kind of getting in with the trends, making sure I was 100% on when I was there. And then I hired a production company, I, I but then I felt like a puppet on a stage where I was just kind of reading a script. It didn't feel authentic. It didn't feel good to me. So I stopped that. And now I just do it intuitively. And I made a New Year's resolution of posting at least one TikTok per day. Uh, and I've kept that New Year's resolution. We're almost at, we're towards the end of January. Um, and so I, I think it's really important to show up for the community that you're fostering there. Um, but yeah, it's important to really like it. If you don't like creating content, if you don't like being on camera, TikTok is not for you. Maybe stick to a Twitter or maybe even an Instagram if you can do photos, but it's really important to enjoy what you're doing. Uh, so yeah, that's what I would, I would say. So do you, do you batch content? Do you shoot a whole bunch at once so that you have some ready? Are you shooting every day? Like what's your, what's your flow with it? Yeah, I actually, I started out batching a lot of content, but I think a lot of times that gets stuck in your drafts. Like I have over 200 videos in my drafts right now. Oh, wow. And I think it's really important to edit your videos on the spot and post them on the spot when you feel that creative flow in you. And one thing that I've heard actually through TikTok is that every idea has a shelf life and, you know, you add your idea to your notes app and then you don't ever go back to it. And, and that idea isn't, isn't executed on. So I really try when I, when I think of an idea, I really try to like sit down and film that idea. Uh, it's just about kind of creating space for it and, and time for it. That's amazing. Um, so I was also curious about your, your launch experience before you were at the graph, you helped to launch orchid. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So so I you did have help. all this yeah. launch experience. Like, are there, do you have launch secrets for success? Like, cause you, I mean, both of those have done really well. I would say what's important is to be really passionate about what you're working on because it, it is really hard to, to launch a project. It's really hard to be a founder. Uh, and if you're just kind of chasing money or, or something or fame or whatever it is, you're not going to be able to get through and push through like the late nights and all of the hard work that it takes. Uh, with Orchid, I was really passionate about getting everyone equal access to the internet across different um, jurisdictions and regions, especially in places like China and Russia, uh, where they have a very segmented uh, internet. And then with the graph, I'm really passionate about kind of the mission of Web3 and really giving power and control back to individuals, empowering individuals. Um, and so I think that first and foremost, you need to have that passion and, and excitement. Um, and then secondly, is just, there's a lot of different pieces to launching and you have to have a lot of different partnerships and relationships ahead of those launches. So that's why someone on the business development side is really crucial and important because you will be like the secret sauce to getting that launch over the finish line. Um, so yeah, it, it's really exciting and, and invigorating to be able to to launch projects and and I'm really excited about the graph and really um yeah just kind of can continue the mission until the graph's kind of a household name similar to to Google. Awesome. Yeah. Is there a playbook that you have for launching, you know, that that helps to leverage those relationships and partnerships? Like is there sort of some sort of step by step or something for founders or for people who are like interested to get started but don't necessarily have that skill set or understand that path? Like what would what would you tell them to do in terms yeah. of just like making the plan? It's definitely, it evolves over time because the space changes so much and the tools that people use back, you know, when I launched the graph might not be the tools that you would use today, but there are definitely things that there's kind of a checklist that you need to go through to make sure, you know, that wallets will be able to support it. Um, you need to just have a, a, a kind of step-by-step -step guide in terms of um, what, what you need to do and you need to have your logo and like in your press kit ready to go. You need to get press on, on it, which a lot of, uh, a lot of engineers don't really understand that side of things. Like press actually does matter. Uh, and it's really important to make sure the press is getting the story right. Um, and so that's another skill set kind of on the business side or marketing side that you really need to think through and have a process for also the community. So telegram, it's really important. Like we have a zero price talk tolerance within the graph ecosystem. Like we are for the mission and with the GRT token, it's really important that the only uh, GRT that's purchased is what you intend to use in the network. 
But with that, you have a Telegram group. You can't control who comes in there. It's permissionless, right? So it's really important to have moderators ready to go in that Telegram group and have strong guidelines, have strong rules. Same with Discord um, around what's allowed and what's not allowed. Uh, so yeah, there's so many different pieces that go into it. Uh, and it's really important to kind of think think everything through, make sure you have strong relationships and um, make sure you get the pieces into place before the launch. Yeah, that makes sense, especially about kind of um, helping to guide the community to be focused on the things that matter and not on the things that don't, right? Like I often say price is the least interesting aspect of this whole space, and yet it's the thing that's focused on the most. It's kind of backwards, you know, it's just kind of like upsetting. And it's like all you hear about from people who are outside the space or your family or whatever is like, oh, price up, price down. And yeah. and it's like, well, sure, but building a new version of the internet that's going to be all of these things is so much more interesting than price up, price down. Totally. You know. And, you know, and price is nothing without usability. And there are so many projects on like this, whatever, the top 20 list that have no usability. It's just marketing. And, you know, it's, it's just not a culture. Isn't that, that crazy? Support. Like how much hype can drive things to me? That's just so crazy. It's like, how does it how do they sustain that hype over time when really it's, what matters, like you're saying, is is utility, is usability, is actually providing some sort of value. Yeah, it's sad because I think that, you know, it, it's the it's the wrong motives, it's the wrong reason, and it's not sustainable, right? And I think it's important when you come into Web3 that you're building something that you think will be around in a hundred years, maybe even in a thousand years, something that really matters. Uh, and that's really what drives me at the graph is because I do think that this technology has the potential to be used by every household in America to get people support in areas like I grew up in Ohio that maybe didn't have support or don't have support or feel hopeless. There's hope on the horizon with Web3. But yeah, if we only focus on the price and not the usability, we'll never make the the change and the impact in the world that we want to make. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I Yeah, I feel the same way that Web3 is hope, you know, in all yeah. of the kind of just like terrible things that are going on in the world and how it, easy it is can, to be sucked into that hopelessness or whatever you want, despair kind of place. It's like, yes, but if you only knew what was being built, like you would understand that things could change really quickly once all of that infrastructure is there. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so along those lines, in terms of running a team and, and launching a product or whatever, before COVID, people a lot of Web3 projects were already decentralized, but now it's like to the next level, right? Like everybody's working from home, working in um, decentralized teams. A lot of them are in different time zones and it can be tricky <laughs> to uh, work that way. Do you have tips for running a decentralized team that help you to still be, I don't know, I think, the main issue that I see is just like efficiency, just like moving forward quickly when you're kind of spread out like that. Yeah, I, I have a lot of tips. So the graph ecosystem or the graph back in the day, and now as a node, five years ago, we started fully remote. Um, and so we, we've always kind of lived in the future that way. I think what's what's important to note in the crypto space is that you know we no longer need companies that are thousands and thousands of people wide anymore. Uh, you, ha you have communities and you're there to really enable the community to span millions, if not billions of people. Um, and so with Edge and Node, we're actually only 60 people. We always want to stay quite small. Um, and we've always kind of having always been distributed. Uh, one, one thing that's really important is like just because you work digitally doesn't mean that you don't meet up in person. And so we used to have quarterly offsites with the team. And that was super important for building morale, for being able to kind of put a face to the Slack name um, and really build build that, that team and that kind of integrity in the team. Um, and so we used to do it quarterly. Now that we've grown to 60 people, it's harder to do it quarterly. We, do, we have uh, annual offsites now. And then each smaller team, like the business team, we get together, we try on like a quarterly basis to, to get together, be it at events or at uh, specific offsites. So I think that that's really my biggest piece of advice is 
make sure that you have space to really meet up in person as well. Um, and then also individually, like you need to make sure that you're not just talking about work when you are online, when you're on zoom, when you're on Slack, you need to bring fun to the space, uh, really try to get to know your colleagues. And one thing, you know, working on zoom, it can be really hard and sometimes the meetings feel really intense. And one way that I've learned to build more empathy on those meetings is to start it by asking like, how was your weekend? Any fun plans coming up? And that way the team's kind of having fun together before we get into the nitty gritty of, of what's on the agenda and, and all of the work. So that's another tip that I really recommend. Yeah, that makes sense. Getting together in person is like kind of, it's like a hybrid model in a way. I mean, it's obviously a much smaller portion of your time getting together in person, but maybe that much more meaningful. And so totally. Yeah. And I think another thing that's really important is just on the company culture, like having a very strong company culture at Edge and Node, where we all work super hard. We have a very high excellence bar, but we're very much mission focused first and foremost. We believe in decentralization. We believe in the mission. And I think it's really important to build a team that really cares about the work that you're doing first and foremost uh, and the impact that you'll have at a larger scale. Yeah, 100%. I was wondering what you think about like what's next in the future of our industry. Um, what kind of things need to happen in order for us to reach a more mainstream kind of place? Yeah. So I think right now the biggest focus is on the Web3 stack, the infrastructure layer. There's a lot of applications that exist on top of the infrastructure right now, but there are pieces that are centralized or they have single points of failure. And so it's really about getting the entire decentralized stack together so that you can have truly decentralized applications. Uh, and so you have things like Arweave, you have things like the graph, you have things like Ethereum and the layer two. So all of them need to connect together uh, so that we can build a really vibrant and strong tech stack that's decentralized, permissionless, open source, all of the key qualities of Web3 uh, so that you can build truly decentralized applications. And that's when I think we'll see the the space really take off we'll see new use cases that can't that aren't even impossible on the web today um so i'm really looking forward to that and i think that decentralized social media is really going to be a big trend of this year in addition to kind of getting that decentralized tech stack together yeah they probably kind of go hand in hand in some ways i mean i think that that makes a lot of sense especially you know in the bear market and and everything that's going on everybody talks about this, this is a time for builders you know, I always feel kind of guilty when I say this, but I actually like bear markets better for that reason, because they're quiet. There's just like less noise. And that means that we can just be really focused on actually moving the ball down the field in terms of building the product and build and like building those connections like you're talking about. Because I think I agree with you that one of the things that's kind of... Um, kind of an issue that we're still facing when it comes to mainstream adoption is like that different protocols are sort of disjointed, right? That the, the end users aren't going to just be like, oh, I want to go use the graph or, you know, <laughs> like they, that they actually need a developer to come in and like connect these different pieces and then present it in a way for a user that has an interface that like feels comfortable and makes sense and yet has all of that connected in the back and that you're seeing a little bit too much of uh, just so far, we're seeing a little bit too much of of independent projects, you know, having kind of like recreating the walled garden problem Un totally unintentionally. It's just that they're just so focused on their own project that it's not like thinking about the larger ecosystem and how to make that fully, fully decentralized user experience. Totally. Yeah. And I, I actually really like bear markets as well, because you can really kind of put your head down, build, you know, there's, you're not being pulled in nine different directions, but what's hard and what, especially this bear market that's been hard is there are a lot of new people to the space that maybe don't really understand the mission or the vision or why we're doing this. And they're like, oh, let's just slap a SaaS model on it and charge for the centralized thing. And it's like, no, like, why would we do that? That's like giving up on the dream, the mission, where we're going, why we're even doing this in the first place. And so I think it's really important to make sure that, you know, when you're bringing people into the company, that they really understand the mission, where you're going, and they're not going to try to take shortcuts uh, or, or only care about building a different business model or, that's or making money. That's a fantastic point, because one of the other things that's frustrating about that is that 
if you have some sort of centralized component, you can actually move faster in your development and get something to market faster that feels more familiar to an end user. And so then then it becomes this like weird sort of um, thing to weigh when you're trying to like get something out and show people that you're able to make this happen, right? Is that like, well, if we have a centralized component, then we can make money faster, we can get the product out faster, it's gonna feel more familiar to end users but we're still then just making something that has a point of failure that's vulnerable. And so, you know, when you're thinking about building one of these projects, the time scale is really different. Although I was wondering about how that affected what you guys just recently built, the geo browser, because some of the stuff I was reading, it said that like that build was actually really fast. Do you have? Yeah, so I, I don't know if I would. I, so with the Geo browser, actually, Yaniv just spun out Geo from Edge and Node, so its own its own independent company. But with Geo, it's actually a browser specifically for Web three, and it's built on the graph, and so it it leverages decentralized data. Um, and yeah, they use a few different components uh, for for the Geo browser, but it is quite easy to use, and they they went iPad first. Um, so it's a really familiar feeling when you do use Geo. Yeah, it's a really cool product. I'm excited. I'm excited about that one. Um, so I wanted to talk about the other things that I think that we need in terms of, you know, getting to mainstream adoption, which has to do with kind of the regulatory environment. You know, we were seeing we just had a new action yesterday. Like there's just been a lot of unpredictability and a lot of fear, I guess I would say. So um, we talked before about how the there's a good argument for why decentralized tokens aren't securities. And I just thought maybe it would be great to talk about that a little bit further. Totally. Yeah. Well, some are securities and some are scams. Uh, and <laughs> others are utility tokens. And I think that it's really important to recognize that there is a new asset class here and you can't kind of try to fit it into the the old structures. Um, and I, I really like Hester Pierce's uh, the, the safe harbor for tokens. I think that that's a really innovative way of thinking about this space. But yeah, as we change incentive structures online, uh, it very much is its own new asset class, in my opinion. Um, and I think that regulators you know, if we look at what happened with FTX before the FTX blow up, regulators were in back doors with Sam trying to regulate decentralized finance when they should have been trying to regulate centralized finance. And if there's one piece of advice I could give to regulators, it's to let the the companies within the centralized finance space let them have the products that they're asking for, like derivatives. They need to approve the Bitcoin ETF. And the reason that FTX went overseas was because of regulators. The reason that FTX was able to get the clientele that it got was because of regulators. And because regulators weren't letting that happen onshore, they, there was demand for the product. So the demand went to FTX overseas and a lot of people got hurt. And so I think it's really important to kind of understand that and to make changes there in a, in a meaningful way so that something like that doesn't happen again. Because guess what? If someone's incentivized to do something like that, someone will do it. Um, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I would that's what I would say there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. There is a huge issue with um, the losing losing this industry to other countries, right? That that, like you said, if there's demand for it, it's going to happen. And it's just kind of a matter of where. And it's the same kind of thing with, let's say, something like manufacturing. Like, if we manufacture it in a place where we understand that the manufacturing regulations and guidelines are going to be followed and are environmentally friendly, then that creates an entirely different product than if it's manufactured overseas in a place that doesn't have any of that kind of stuff. And it, you can think of that in the same kind of way when it comes to regulating Web3 in that if we're able to have it be built here, then it will be, I don't know if safer is the right word, <laughs> but uh, it will be safer for the end users to be able to engage with these products because the demand is there kind of one way or the other. There's one piece which is keeping innovation here in the US, which we're already starting to lose that. Um, but then there's another piece where 
at the centralized uh, entities, at the fiat on-ramps, you do need regulations. And that's really where the regulators should focus. And I think one of the failures was them trying to focus on decentralized finance, which we've seen decentralized finance is absolutely fine. It's still running, it's solvent. And they missed a huge gaping hole at the centralized finance layer. And you know, had it not come down when it did, FTX, when it, mm-hmm. had it not collapsed when it did, who knows what would have happened? Who knows, you know, maybe Sam would have gotten those that that bill through, DeFi would be regulated and he would still be running a scam. Uh, and mm-hmm. that's really scary to think. So I think that, yeah, the regulators really need to, to think about it. Yeah. Do you have any predictions about the future of Ethereum in that regard, in terms of regulation or otherwise and what it needs there? I think that smart contracts are a form of regulation in and of themselves, right? Regulators create... Uh, regulations, people circumvent those regulations and they have to patch them up. With a smart contract, it's open source. Everyone can see the code. Everyone can see where there are issues. You patch up that code and it it fixes itself. And we've seen this with so many bugs and contracts, not Ethereum itself, but uh, at the the application layer, we've seen that a lot of times. Um, And so I think that the need for regulators when it comes to a smart contract, when it comes to decentralized infrastructure is much, much less. Where they need to focus is at the fiat on and off ramps, uh, not so much at the the smart contract layer. That's a great answer. Yeah, that totally yeah. makes sense. It's kind of like one of the things that I like to talk about, too, is just kind of how um, the nature of Web3 is that it's sort of like self-enforcing that way, like what you're talking about with smart contracts. It's like it's transparently available go check it out and then it's kind of like self-regulating really in that way that like maybe some of the regulations that we would typically need for financial disclosures you don't necessarily need because it's just there Mm -hmm. you know totally yeah yeah absolutely yeah um okay well this was awesome since it's the name of the series i always like to ask at the end what kind of internet do you want yeah, so I really want to see a decentralized internet where people can get paid for the contributions that they add. I want to see people get paid commensurate to the value that they bring to the internet. I want to see a place where people can coordinate freely, permissionlessly with like-minded people to help solve the world's biggest challenges and problems. And I want to see us be really thoughtful about the incentive structures for the decentralized internet to avoid some of the negative externalities that we've seen in web one and, and web two. I love that. Thank you so much. Yay. Okay. Amazing. Next time. <laughs> Thank you.